Got it. Oh, Cliff's just asking in the chat. Hi, Curtis. Enjoying the heat in Tucson. Yeah. <laughs> How really hot is hit. it? <laughs> oh, it's about average of 110 this week almost. Oh my goodness, that's average. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the end of June is generally the most brutal week in Tucson. And it's living up to its reputation. You know, even uh Last night I had a screech owl in the middle of the night come into my bird bath, take a big long drink. We had a, a bunny that was just laying in the shade under the bird bath all day. <laughs> you could just see all these animals trying to make it through the heat. Wow. So I just added it up, Kurt, just short of 44,000. 44,000. Oh, my God. Wow. That's enough, that's enough to treat 880 acres. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> my God. That's great. And we're, this is just for testing purposes, so we're just getting started. Are you, so are you still waiting for, for approval from USDA or EPA, or where does that stand now? It's, it's with FDA and we're never gonna get approval, but if we follow certain rules, they will choose not to enforce the law. Okay. <laughs> that sounds like a good workaround. Yeah, it's a mess, but we're proceeding. Okay, good, that's great news, my God. Yep, Randy's our rock star in the ferret world, working on his invention, it's amazing. Um, Okay, we should kick it off. Yeah, you betcha. I think we've got our, our RSVPs here and any more to come, fantastic. Uh, let me take myself off video. Okay, there we go. Hi, everyone. Uh, Shami Anderson, Senior Representative with Defenders of Wildlife. I'm also Chair of our Steering Committee for the Great Plains Conservation Network. Um, by the way, we, if, if folks don't know us, uh, please sign up for our listserv. We have a great uh, coordinator, Lindsay Wallace, who puts, pushes out information on all things plains, wildlife, and restoration from Canada to Mexico. Um, we're sort of a repository, a clearinghouse of information through our website and our listserv, notifying everyone about RFVPs, about job opportunities, about new research, about projects, and we have three working groups, bison, prairie dogs, and mapping that meet on a regular basis with uh, experts from around the country um, and in Canada and, and Mexico, who um, really help to synergize uh, research information and, um, and work on individual projects for, under our Great Plains Conservation Network. Um, Really happy too, because we um, have now become sort of a good place to learn information about from our experts. And we're really proud and pleased today to uh, have Kurt Frazee, uh, a, a renowned research and expert in native plains, wildlife and grasslands uh, to present his book today, Back from the Collapse, American Prairie and the Restoration of Great Plains Wildlife. And um, I'm going to give you a little background about Kurt. Um, he's an ecologist, co-founder of American Prairie, and founding managing director of World Wildlife Fund's Northern Great Plains program. He formerly ran the Fish and Wildlife Service's Latin American program and was World Wildlife Fund's vice president for conservation programs in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Kurt is the author of an editor of four books, including American Bison, uh, status Survey and Conservation Guidelines, and his newest book, uh, which has just come out uh, and is available for purchase, and we have, we'll give you, put the link in the chat, if you'd be so kind, Lindsay. Back from the Collapse, American Prairie and the Restoration of Great Plains Wildlife. Um, and so it's, it's a real honor to have 
Kurt here, and thank you for agreeing to give this talk, and we're going to record it, so anyone that missed it will have the opportunity to, to see it again, uh, or purchase the book, even better, right? Uh, <laughs> but with that, I'd like to um, please offer uh, Kurt Breezy. All right. Uh, thank you, Shami. Also, uh, thanks to Lindsay Wallace for helping get this all organized. And uh, thanks for the Great Plains Conservation Network for uh, hosting this. Um, I should say, uh, what I'm going to talk about mostly, my book is mostly about the why and what of American Prairie, and uh, not so much the how. Um, if I get into thanking all the people that helped me on the book, as well as all the people that have made the success of American Prairie possible, I'll eat up more than half my time, a lot of time today. So I simply have to avoid going into the acknowledgements of everybody that's been crucial, both for the book and for American Prairie. Uh, so um, let, me, uh, let me launch into it. I think especially because of the Great Plains Conservation Network, I'd like to at least provide a quick look at how this all got started. If I can make my, uh oh, hang on, it's not advancing. Hmm. There we go. Now I did. Thank goodness. Uh, first of all, I'm going to make one exception to acknowledgments. My uh, my daughter Erica did 13 uh, drawings to help uh, provide some artistic relief to my. Uh, to the book. And so uh, thanks to Erica, that was a lot of fun to have her do these drawings. They uh, grace the book throughout. Um, the uh, the start of the American Prairie goes back to uh, the year 2000. This is, a, uh, this is the Lindley Center in Bozeman, Montana. And it's where in, on August uh, 7th to 9th, the year 2000, the Northern Plains Conservation Network, which is the predecessor to the Great Plains Conservation Network, was established. And there was a meeting, it was called the High Plains Ecosystem Restoration Design uh, and uh, at the Lindley Center. And the participants, these are the notes from uh, Kathy Daly of the Wildlands Project staff. These are the participants that were there just to get everybody a quick look. I think there's a couple well, three people she missed. In fact, I think Randy Matthew, you may have been there even briefly. But um, this is an eclectic group of people from national organizations like uh, World Wildlife Fund, uh, um, uh, Sierra Club, and so on, down to very local groups. But they came together. And at that time, this is a graph from around the year 2000 of of uh, biomes of the world and how much are in protected areas. And you can see at the bottom, temperate grasslands are at about 1%. And that represented about what was protected in the Great Plains in terms of refuges and parks. 1% protection, less than any other biome in the world, or for that matter, in North America. So this is what the participants at the meeting were concerned about. And there are a bunch of uh, antecedents to that meeting that made a big difference in terms of the attitude of people at the meeting about what needs to be done. I mentioned conservation biology, Soule and Wilcox books in that book in 1980, simply because that really kicked off conservation biology, which was identifying the need for bigger protected areas to provide restoration protection long-term for endangered species. 81, the black-footed ferret was rediscovered. 1987, the poppers came out with the buffalo commons, which of course created an uproar across the Great Plains. And then there was a seminal paper in 1987 by William Newmark that looked at the extinction of mammals in our biggest Western parks and found out the parks were not big enough to avoid extinction. 1995, we found out there were gene, uh, cattle genes in bison, and there are a series of new books coming out on the bison demise. Stephen Ambrose's un, uh, Undaunted Courage in 1996 really provided a, a spotlight on Northeast Montana, the Missouri River, and what wildlife was like then. And then in 1996, Fritz Knopp came out with his uh, often uh, quoted 
statement that grassland birds were declining faster than any other group of birds in North America. And that next year, he and Fred Sampson noted that the Great Plains were North America's most endangered ecosystem. So essentially the bottom line for the participants at that meeting was the Great Plains wildlife is in trouble, ignored too long. We've got to have bigger and more protected areas and they wanted to, needed to take some bold action. At that time, just before the meeting in 1999, the Nature Conservancy came out with this assessment of the Northern Great Plains Steppe. And in it, they identified the Montana Glaciated Plains, which I've circled here in Northeast Montana, just on the north side of the Charles and Russell Refuge, including part of the refuge, as a very high priority. So at the meeting, we eventually took a vote on the priority actions. And the leading vote getter was, as, and these are directly from Kathy Daly's notes again, a bold proposal for Phillips County to buy ranches uh, between the refuge and the Fort Belknap Indian Reservation to restore mountain plovers, ferrets, and so on. Number two vote getter was monument designation for the Missouri Breaks. And the third was building a constituency of grasslands. So that was this audacious idea of this eclectic group of people at this meeting said, yeah, let's go buy a bunch of land and make a big protected area. So here's a quick startup uh, timeline. August 2000 was the meeting, NP NPCN got launched as this loose coalition. Somewhere around January or so, we decided that we needed a new nonprofit for the project. There wasn't a land trust that was going to do it. I couldn't talk World Wildlife Fund into doing it. And then uh, in January of 2001 also, just before Clinton left office, he declared the Upper Missouri River Breaks National Monument. So check number two on that priority list getting done. Uh, and then somewhere around January to June 2001, we delineated roughly the project area. By June 2001, the Articles of Incorporation that Steve Forrest helped me prepare were approved. At that time, we called it the Prairie Foundation. And then we obviously we had to find some startup funding. So World Wildlife Fund provided startup funding, the Packard Foundation, and then some very generous individuals. So that's kind of that quick startup. Here's the project area. Again, I use my pointer. Here's the Charles and Russell Refuge. All this in beige area is refuge. And then out here, these are BLM lands. So there's a couple of million acres of BLM lands, the Indian Fort Belknap Indian Reservation, Upper Missouri River Breaks Monument, Missouri River, Fort Peck Reservoir. So this is the general area outlined. And we kind of came up with this figure if we looked at consolidating, building off the refuge as an anchor protected area, something of about 5,000 square miles or 3.2 million acres. And uh, so that was our initial idea. In fact, I looked at my notes, I think we even had it a bit bigger. So this is purely coincidence in some sense. This is, this is the graph from William Newmark's 1987 paper of 14 protected areas, parks in the Western US. And it simply shows the intercept on the, uh, on the X axis is about at 3.2 million acres, the size you need to avoid extinction of mostly large mammals. So that tells me we were in the neighborhood. And then a couple of years later, independently, Dale Lott, who came out with the book, American Bison, uh, he figured that we needed about 5,000 square miles to have an ecologically meaningful bison population. So uh, from independent directions, uh, something told us that we were maybe in the right neighborhood for a large protected area to restore grassland diversity. So the timeline continued. Uh, first property was acquired in 2004, bison reintroduced in 2005. Um, the uh, Wild Sky Wildlife Friendly Ranching Program has started in Rico Education Center. They opened the National Discovery Center in Lewistown last year. And then also this year, the 37th land transaction was done, bringing the total of 460,800 acres. 
uh, joined with the 1.1 million CMR refuge, that takes us about halfway towards the 3.2 million acre goal. And then I just quickly mentioned here, there's a bunch of collaboration that's developed over the years besides the refuge and BLM. Fort Belknap has been a great partner in restoration work. The Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute has now adopted the American Prairie region as its uh, long for long-term research and great Plains Conservation and Biodiversity, National Geographic, Ken Burns, the Ken Burns American Heritage Prize now uh, are working with us. And then numerous nonprofits, Defenders of Wildlife, uh, the Prairie Dog Coalition, um, Montana Outdoor Science School, lots of universities. So the, the, the level of collaboration has been remarkable. So here's, a, here's my quick take on the eight largest protected areas in the Great Plains. And it gives you the sense of the scale that we're looking at. Uh, American Prairie Russell Refuge sits here now at about 1.6 million, long-term goal 3.2. The next biggest protected area is B Badlands National Park. And then Grasslands National Park in Canada, Suffield National Wildlife Area also in Alberta, Valentine National Wildlife Refuge, Theodore Roosevelt National Park, Wichita Mountains, and then the Southern Plains Land Trust uh, in Colorado. Here's our current situation with American Prairie lands. Uh, this color here, and you can see somewhat rather fragmented yet, the idea is to fill in these blank spaces eventually. And again, building off the refuge as the anchor for protected areas. Um, I just point out this area alone here, this is a big, uh, big Timber Creek area at 158,000 acres. That would by itself be the fourth largest protected area in the Great Plains. So it's just to give you a sense of the scale that we're talking about here. Uh, I'm not going to get into chapters two and three. I talk about the deep history of the region. It's like if you're looking at Mayan temples or, or Egyptian pyramids, if you don't know about the history of an area, I don't think you can fully appreciate it. So I've spent a couple of chapters about, about the uh, evolutionary geological evolution of Northeast Montana in this uh, in the Montana glaciated plains. But eventually, about 8,000 years ago, it all started to come together. And I think a guidebook to the Great Plains 8,000 years ago would work pretty well today, actually. But here's kind of the four major habitats we might we might uh, categorize for the project area. Missouri River breaks, the Missouri River, or excuse me, Missouri River in the floodplain, Missouri River breaks, Badlands habitat, that's Fort Peck Lake here in the reservoir in the background. And then uh, sagebrush steppe, those are the Larb Hills in the background, and then the mixed grass prairie, and those are the uh, little rocky mountains in the background. Just a quick note on the biodiversity of the region. Here's a quick take on comparison to Badlands National Park and Yellowstone Park. Um, so good diversity. One thing that we have less of a handle on is insect diversity, but Probably around 75 species, at least of grasshopper, 140 species of butterflies. And right now, the USDA, USDA researchers are looking at uh, solitary beast uh, diversity in, in the region. So we're probably looking at 100 to 200 species. Chapter four then goes into the uh, five periods of Euro-American influence on wildlife. I broke it down into five periods. From 1500 Lewis and Clark, the main thing there is before any Europeans arrived in the flesh, European diseases and the horse got there first. With major influence, obviously, on Native Americans, the diseases were deadly, and the horse and disease affected Native American hunting of wildlife. Then, after, from Lewis and Clark to the era of open range ranching around 1980 or 1884, that started. And brought on the fur trade, slaughter of be uh, beaver, slaughter of ungulates begins, 
in the peak of Native American persecution. And then the nexus from open range ranching to homesteader collapse. That's when we had a bounty on wolves and puma, uh, the livestock boom, and the first big plow up with the homesteader settlement. And then homesteader exodus to World War II. There we had major uh, plow ups uh, continuing the development. I'm sorry, the prairie dog poisoning era. And then because of the destitute rent uh, farming community, there was the biggest buyback in the US, more than 100 million acres the US government bought uh, from uh, homesteaders in the American Prairie Russell Refuge region. Fort Peck, Fort Peck Dam was constructed and the CM Russell Refuge was created. And then finally, the 1940s of the present, the main thing there is continued plow up, the development of pesticides, more dam construction, but thankfully, finally, the conservation movement in various uh, dimensions. So here's the core of the book, chapters five to 11, where I look at 24 population collapses within the American Prairie Russell Refuge region. By collapse, I mean the population collapsed by at least 90% since Euro-American uh, settlement. In all, about 14 mammals, that includes all the 10 most common mammals, of adult weight greater than 40 pounds, every one of them, eight bird species, one fish, one insect, and probably many more. But I was conservative in picking these 24 species. First to go was the beaver and the river otter. Here, uh, I provide these, uh, these, what I say, estimates of how the populations collapsed and recovered. So the first trappers arrived one year after Lewis and Clark got back to St. Louis. And so the beaver population took a, a quick plunge, as did the river otter. The river otter is a commensal of beavers in the Great Plains. No beaver, more, more likely, very few or no river otters. And, uh, but the river otter or the beaver population did recover. River otter has likely never recovered. There are a few now that we see occasionally, uh, but both beaver, the beaver population is certainly much lower than it was historically because of dam construction, the Fort Peck Reservoir, which is not beaver habitat and other factors. This is just a quick look at uh, where the distribution of the river otter and by, by uh, association, the beaver in North America, by 1977, the river otter was gone from the Great Plains. So here's the problem. We've got cattle in the streams, we've got dams, uh, stock ponds, uh, beaver trapping, and uh, but what can happen when you change the situation, this is Beaver Creek. We changed from cattle to bison in 2014. I should say the American Prairie did uh, stop trapping beaver. And I'm standing in a 100 foot long beaver dam here where it was nothing but a channel of a stream 10 years earlier. Um, an amazing rapid transition. Uh, we even saw a couple of moose along here a couple of years ago. So an amazing transition with beaver getting back into the uh, system. The next collapse I looked at are the six ungulates in the region. I should say there's seven. The moose is the seventh one, but they're so rare, I didn't attempt to look at uh, numbers of collapse. But here's a general take on the collapse. Probably the first to go is the bighorn sheep because of the heavy river traffic. Bighorns are only found along the Missouri in the breaks habitat. And uh, they probably got hit first because of river traffic and fur trappers. But then the others all went accordingly. And uh, the growth and hide in the meat markets, it's been widely discussed, obviously, the collapse of the bison. We did have recovery of the deer population uh, in the late 30s. They recovered probably the eruptive growth, in part perhaps at that time, there are no mountain lions to prey on them in the region. And I'd say it's only partial recovery of elk, pronghorn, mule deer. They're kept in check because of crop depredation. And uh, the populations largely, especially for elk, reside in the Charles and Russell Refuge. 
And bison, of course, have just been reintroduced by American prairie, as well as the uh, local Indian tribes. Uh, the uh, reintroduction of bison began in, um, well, I'm going to back up here. I want to quit. Just to comment on the change. The change in ungulates by, I've got the number here, by 1886, the bison had disappeared from the eastern Montana. There were 664,000 cattle by that time. And then by 1910, there were 6 million sheep in eastern Montana. So you had this massive ungulate swap from wild ungulates to, uh, to uh, domestic livestock. And I should say then the elk and bighorn sheep were reintroduced into the uh, Charles and Russell Refuge in the Brakes Habitat during starting in the 1940s and 1950s. Deer and pronghorn came back on their own. And then in uh, 2005, American Prairie reintroduced the first bison here being released from the, the straw bale quarantine place. Um, the first bison came from Wind Cave National Park. Later bison reintroductions have, have come from bison uh, captured in Elk Island National Park in Alberta. So here's my potential numbers on 3.2 million acres. The bottom line is we could have 100,000 ungulates out there, maybe eating 35% of the primary productivity of the, of the grasslands and breaks habitat. Uh, that is just a potential number. That's not a goal. And we know that numbers are going to fluctuate widely and they're going to change as wolves and grizzly bears come back on the, uh, the uh, landscape. But that's a first crude attempt. Um, with just one comment here about bison. What's fascinating to me is within this region right now, we have five essentially conservation herds of bison. Rocky Boys Indian Reservation has just started a bison population. Fort Belknap Indian Reservation has one. Fort Peck uh, Reservation has a bison herd. Grasslands National Park and American Prairie and the Charles and Russell Refuge would like to get a bison herd. There's a, a look at that possibility. So we could have six bison herds in this region. And someday we can just get rid of the fences, maybe build some highway over uh, wildlife overpasses up here on Highway 2 and have a herd of 50,000 bison roaming this landscape. So that's something to think about for the future. I think about, about uh, Keith Oney and, um, and uh, Glenn Plum's recent book, American Bison and Theodore Roosevelt, where they talk about shared stewardship and getting away from this idea that we have in North America that bison belong only behind fences. And this is a vision for perhaps that shared stewardship idea of Ani and, uh, and uh, Plum. How about carnivores? Here are the four that I looked at besides the ferret, which I'll talk about later. Go to my notes here. Here's what um, probably the plunge looked like in, in carnivore numbers. Their first to go was probably the grizzly bear, again, because it was along the Missouri River, getting into trouble surely with beaver trappers. And he had steamboat traffic up in the, the Missouri. That was the only mode of transport on the river, probably getting the grizzly bears in a lot of trouble. And then the collapse of the others uh, came later. And um, there was a bounty instituted on uh, wolves and puma, I think it was 1886. In the late 1880s and 1890s, mostly in eastern, in the plains of eastern Montana, four to 6,000 wolf bounties were paid every year. It's an amazing number uh, being taken annually from the prairies of eastern Montana. Traps are set, strict nine baits are used. You can imagine then swift fox, golden eagles eating the strict nine laced bison carcasses and lots of other things dying in the process. Um, the uh, 
I should say, going back, the puma has come back on its own. Uh, the swift fox was first reintroduced. Uh, it was ex it was extirpated from the northern part of its range, and uh, and then in uh, 1883 there are reintroductions in Saskatchewan and Alberta, and uh, and then uh, Fort Peck reintroduced them in 2006, and then now in 2020 a reintroduction program began on the Fort Belknap Indian Reservation with the help of World Wildlife Fund, the Smithsonian Institution, American Prairie, and others. Uh, and so that's a, a great step forward in getting a, a population established south of the Milk River. And eventually, the wolves and the grizzly bears will make it back on their own. The wolves, I mean, the grizzly bears, as, you, as this photo suggests, are wandering further and further from the Rocky Mountain front onto the prairie. They've been in the project area in the last year. So uh, at some point when we create sufficient social tolerance, they will come back on their own. How many could we have? Puma, we could have 75 to 150. There's, all, as I said, they're already there. Uh, grizzly bear, maybe 150 to 400. Wolf numbers could be anywhere, I don't know, 300 to 800. That's a dozens of packs. The swift fox, the uh, the uh, prediction is that uh, the region could su support perhaps 450 to 500 swift fox. Then a forgotten one, the Rocky Mountain locust. It's the only locust in North America. And it was a ecological phenomenon of incredible magnitude in the 1880 in the 1800s. Here's an example. It's called Albert Swarm in 1875 in, in Nebraska. It was estimated to be 1,800 miles long by 110 miles wide, stacked a quarter mile to half mile deep. Trillions of locusts. That's bigger than the state of California. Uh, and as these uh, as these cartoons and fake photo indicate. People were quite, quite astounded. The uh, the estimate was in uh, in let me see, 1874, 74 percent of U.S. farm production was lost to locusts. Jeffrey Lockwood has come out with a book I recommend reading. It's a highly readable book. He referred to locusts as a metabolic wildfire. Uh, so clearly, they had a tremendous ecological influence. In the region, they lay their they lay their eggs in uh, in the ground. the uh, The United States just, uh, created the U.S. Entomological Commission, headed up by an eccentric scientist Charles Riley in the 1870s to study the locust. Uh, they came out with three ma major reports on how to try to control it. Nothing they could do in terms of all these contraptions they created could control the locust. And uh, this is the map they created. The permanent zone includes the project area where they were in the non-migratory phase, where they would stay for a couple of years and in the non-migratory phase. And then they would break out and swarm across the Great Plains in their migratory phase. And that's when they would wreak devastation. Uh, one swarm could, uh, one estimate was could go through, burn through about 100 tons of vegetation per day. Native Americans in Montana talked about bison herds having to move away from the bison, from the locust swarms to find uh, vegetation to eat, to find forage. Um, so it was clearly an ecological phenomenon. And then for unknown reasons, it collapsed and a swarm never to be seen again. The last two specimens were collected in 1902 in Manitoba. And uh, I won't go into that any further, except they may still survive. Larry, uh, um, Jeffrey Lockwood leaves that question open. They may survive that in a non-migratory phase in some meadow in the valleys of Yellowstone Park, for example, where he, where he looked for them. 
but clearly a, a major force, ecological force that we've lost in the Great Plains. I should say an example is um, of their effects. Mountain plovers in Nebraska were found to have 27 to 36 locusts per stomach in, in examined. And uh, there's Boyne's suggestion that the Eskimo curlew extinction may have uh, been um, in part caused by the loss of the of the locust because in the spring the locust eggs would have been a predictable site of food for migratory birds coming back north. I think most everybody probably on this uh, call is familiar with the ferret and prairie dog problems we've got. Maybe we have 350 50 black footed ferrets left in the wild right now. They've been struggling for years. The collapse probably started in the 1880s with just the uh, open range livestock era. People, ranchers starting to trap them. And then we had the big uh, uh, US government sponsored eradication program in the 30s, 20s and 30s. And then the big, the final killer threat is the plague epizootic that has been ravaging prairie dog populations since it arrived in the US. On the American Prairie Restoration work, the idea we, we I think Jonathan, if you're on the call, I think there's a Jonathan Proctor on the left, left side here filling in the uh, artificial nest box hole. But the key thing as uh, Randy Matthews who's on the call, I think is we've got to control plague. And so these are uh, dust people with the uh, dusters, uh, dusting prairie dog goals against the fleas that carry the plague. And um, and one of the key things that I know match, in fact, we were just talking about this before we started this call, is coming up with a second a pulicide, a second way to control the fleas besides deltamethrin. And, and so working, developing fipronil, a systemic a pulicide that can fill, kill the fleas. So we can switch back and forth as fleas develop resistance to one and then the other. So this is a crucial way a crucial effort that we've got to have to rebuild prairie dog and then ferret populations potentially we could have fifty thousand acres of prairie dogs 300 ferrets just in the project area or more there probably used to be two hundred thousand acres of prairie dogs since they poisoned about 180,000 acres in the 20s and 30s there so why not aim high the palace sturgeon this is probably one that maybe people are less familiar with. This is Mike Schultz of Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks with Pallid Sturgeon. Uh, sturgeon, and um, let me look at my notes. They get six six feet long, eighty pounds. They live in the bottom of big muddy rivers from the upper Missouri to the lower Mississippi. They haven't really changed much since the dinosaurs. They were first described by science in 1905. And uh, this upper Missouri population is genetically distinct from populations in, in the Mississippi. It's the biggest population in terms of size and, and the size of the, uh, of the fish. And uh, it's critically endangered. The killer of all threats are dams. This is the Fort Peck Dam completed in the Missouri in 1940. The problem is it prevents migration of upriver, the, the uh, pallet has to migrate maybe 200 miles to, to spawn. And then they have to float downriver as free floating embryos to mature to the free swimming stage. Uh, the dams alter the downstream flow, release, releasing cold water. And these reservoirs are death traps for the sturgeon. So they are a huge problem for pallets. Here's the dams that we're looking at um, in the region. The uh, Fort Peck Dam right here, and the population of the pallet is divided into two now, the one below the dam and above the Garrison Dam, below Fort Peck and above Garrison and up the Yellowstone River, and then one, on one above the Fort Peck Dam here, up into the Marias. There are many just one, genetically one population, but they are separated by the Fort Peck Dam. Here's the collapse. 
First was the construction of a dam, a check dam on the Yellowstone River, then the Fort Peck Dam probably, and then the Garrison Dam. And now you've got a population that has not had wild production and the reproduction of the wild since probably in probably more than 50 years, since or 60 years, since the 1950s. There are only perhaps a dozen or so wild born sturgeon left in the wild. They may be gone by this year. The last wild born one, the population is entirely dependent now on hatchery born fish. And unless we can change dam releases, remove dams, uh, the likelihood of recovery through wild reproduction is uncertain at best. Here's an attempt in the Yellowstone River. They built this bypass for letting pallid sturgeons go upstream and around the, uh, the check dam. There's a new check dam now under construction or just been finished. But um, whether this works is entirely up in the air. Apparently fish have been going around and using this, whether or not it's enough to provide significant reproduction is another question. And then finally, uh, the eight bird species I look at, uh, grouse, uh, sage grouse, burrowing owl, uh, the two long spur species, uh, lark bunting, sprags, pipit, grasshopper, sparrow, and mountain plover. Just a reminder of how significant this area is for grassland birds. This shows the, uh, the concentration of the number of breeding and wintering grassland birds in North America. So the project area is right in the middle of high, high diversity of breeding grassland birds. Here shows the, uh, the plunge in numbers, um, probably starting with hunting of sage grouse and mountain plover. They're hunted, mountain plover incredibly was hunted for food, both on the, on the nesting and in the wintering habitat. And then we had a plunge in plover and burrowing owl numbers with the eradication of prairie dogs, and then a general decline as we, um, as uh, grasslands are plowed up, and as we've lost heterogeneous grazing by live, by bison, uh, and we've lost fire as a, and prairie dogs create this heterogeneous habitat that grassland songbirds depend on. Restoration work, receding native prairie, get the bison, prairie dogs back in there, fire back in, and then research going on. This is Andy Boyce with the uh, Long Bill Curlew uh, research looking at what we need to do to help restore grassland birds. This is an ugly graph, I admit it, but it, uh, I just threw together all the 24 species collapses. And uh, maybe a better way to visualize this is looking at the mammal collapse. Here's what we had in 1800. Here's what we had by 1930. Most of them gone or the highly uh, diminished population. The exception may have been the coyote, which may have thrived with the wolf gone. By today, we've got some recovery, but not nearly enough. And I should, as I mentioned before, I, those 24 species are probably, uh, there's more than that. Bees, butterflies, grasshoppers are not monitoring, but they're declining. We've got chubs, blue sucker in the Missouri that are probably declining. Could be the heart, the horned lark, barred sparrow, long-headed shrike. Little brown bat may be collapsing as we speak from the caves of the region and so on. And of course, if we went across the Great Plains, there'd be a whole lot more collapses we could talk about. I thought I'd, I'd thought take one other look at this collapse. Somebody, Greenspoon et al, just came out with a look at the collapse of uh, wild mammal biomass globally. And their estimate was it's about now 9% wild biomass, 91% livestock biomass globally. Most of that wild bass, wild uh, mammal biomass is marine mammals. So I did a quick calculation. I think it's about 95, less than 5% uh, wild mammal biomass 
in the remaining grasslands of the Great Plains. Here's a general trend of perhaps starting with the horse and, and, and cattle in the Southern Great Plains, and then the quick collapse of the, with, the, with the bison kill off uh, in the 1870s and 80s. And I think we're down to less than 5%, which is to me an atrocious figure in terms of how we've converted the Great Plains biomass. What that reminds me of, I could simply replace these fish with large mammals and fish and birds, and it would re replicate Daniel Pauli's 1995 TED talk showing the collapse of fish stocks and what that means in terms of creating the shifting baseline syndrome, where we every generation of fish biologists thinks that what they saw originally was the natural condition as opposed to something much diminished from what was originally there. And the bottom line for me is if we're going to reverse this trend, we need more and bigger protected areas in the Great Plains. Protected areas are the cornerstone of biodiversity conservation. We start off with the I a key target that was established by the Con uh, Convention on Biological Diversity in 2010 of 17%. General recognition that was more of a political target than E.O. Wilson came up with the half Earth concept in his book. And then recently, as approved by the Convention on Biological Diversity in 2022, this idea of 30% protected by the year 2030. That's what we should set as targets. Here's where we are yet in the Great Plains. We are still at 2%, less than 2% in protected area status. Here's the 17% protected area line, that modest goal. Other, we're again, still in North America, the least protected biome uh, and or among the least protected. So what are we doing about it? To me, there are three, Three main pillars of Great Plain conservation. No more grassland to cropland conversion, biodiversity friendly ranch lands to provide connect connectivity of habitat, and then somewhere in the 17 to 30% range of protected area coverage that includes small reserves and protected areas. But we got to have big million acre plus protected areas for comprehensive biodiversity restoration. The two biggest, to what I've seen, the two major recent grassland initiatives in the Northern Great Plains have been the, uh, uh, the grassland, North American Grassland Conservation Act of 2022. That has no mention of protected areas whatsoever. It does provide, obviously, support for the first two pillars of grassland conversion and wildlife-friendly ranching. Similar, similarly, the Central Grasslands Roadmap now being put together as only one mention of grassland protected areas. That's one that to fund resource gaps on indigenous protected areas. But otherwise, it too focuses almost exclusively on the conversion problem and rancher uh, wildlife friendly ranching. There's a to me a big disconnect. Luckily. We have, however, one possibility here that I think is avoided attention. The conservation in North America analysis of land-based conservation in Canada, Mexico, and the United States by NAPA, the North American Intergovernmental Committee in Cooperation for Wilderness and Protected Area Conservation. Here's a statement from their, in chapter two, they have a demonstration example, for, which is grasslands. The potential priority for conservation, conservation areas identified through our analyses cover significant portions of the historical range of most grasslands. Sustained efforts could allow North America to meet and potentially exceed the 17% protection target. So here I have a document that lays out by federal agencies of the US, Canada, and Mexico, a, a protected area target, but Nobody, to my knowledge, except the Wild Foundation, which is a facilitator for this effort. No, there's been very little attention by the nonprofit 
conservation community to supporting this agency-led idea. And they are now meeting again, doing more planning to how to implement the North American plan. Uh, part of the agency's analysis was done here by uh, Comer and Hoagland, uh, showing protected area, potential protected areas across the Great Plains. And so I end up with these actions that the Great Plains Conservation Community, I think, should take. We got to pr promote protected areas as a cornerstone. We got to support NAPA's work. We should have a for we should have a strategy for protected area growth. That's a nonprofit community is helping lead. Obviously, support indigenous protected areas. BLM has a proposed use of uh, land uh, lands uh, rule right now to create conservation easement uh, leases. Uh, get comments in by July fifth. Support the American Prairie and the Russell Refuge as a showcase, and in doing so, we can build public support, perhaps because. The American Prairie and the Russell Refuge can provide therapy for the shifting baseline syndrome that I think afflicts all of us. I'll let George Horch Capture Jr. have the last word about the environmental amnesia that I think we suffer from. Thank you. That's all I have. Look forward to any uh, discussion. Great, thanks, Chris. Um, does anybody have uh, questions? You can help your hand up. Maybe I'll uh, just ask you a quick one. So, oh, here, yeah, uh, Cliff's got one in the chat. Any ideas on more integration of indigenous into APR management, harvest, et cetera? Um, the, the integration, there are neighbors to each other, American Prairie and uh, Fort Belknap Reservation. Um, I guess the integration is, a, one is that, um, for example, with Fort Belknap, there's an exchange of bison for genetic improvement. American Prairie has donated bison to start or help augment three or four or, or maybe five uh, uh, indigenous bison herds. And now um, this collaboration, you know, we're looking at side by side growing prairie dog colonies, helping with potentially now the, re the uh, Fort Belknap Reservation is the only place in the region that has black footed ferrets. So if we can help grow prairie dog colonies, onto American prairie lands and expand that ferret population, that's gonna be great. Um, so there's a lot of cooperation going on right now. Uh, um, George Horch Capture Jr. here on the slide is an advisor to American Prairie. Great. Uh, oh, Shami's got her hand up. Go ahead, Shami. Hey, Cliff. Kurt, that was extremely, um, Cliff's comment was what I was actually going to be following up on. Um, American Prairie is such a model in conservation for our native grassland species. What can the federal agencies be doing more of? I mean, we have national grasslands, of, obviously, of, of key large landscapes, as your recommendation entails. Um, what do you suggest in terms of our advocacy efforts for federal land managers in lieu of that recommendation? Um, I think uh, I mean, one is obviously the, uh, the example of the BLM proposal for uh, conservation leases is a step in the right direction. Um, I think the opportunity over the next 10 years is to both for national grasslands and BLM lands is to, I think the shift, the shift should be towards more protected area objectives of restoration of other grassland species, including bison, including where we can get large enough land mass, wolves, uh, including right now, prairie dogs is a good example. BLM still allows prairie dog shooting on BLM lands right in the American Prairie Russell Refuge region where we need to grow prairie dogs. Meanwhile, another agency, the Fish and Wildlife Service, 
of the very same Department of the Interior is spending millions trying to save prey dogs and ferrets. That's absurd. So there's there's a few things out there that I think we really need to push the agencies on. Uh, and I know the uh, the rancher opposition can be uh, often uh, is significant, but uh, I think uh, I think um, we've got to make the public more aware of the values of these federal lands for wildlife. Thank you, Kurt. Um, there's uh, yeah, another question in the chat here. Thanks so much for your talk. This has been fascinating. In the long term, are there plans to shift AP properties to public ownership, e.g. enlarging the CMR, other federal designations, or is the intention for it to remain privately held in perpetuity? The intention, I think I, I can speak for American Prairie, is to hold it in, in uh, perpetuity. The reason is we think, American Prairie thinks, it provides a check against the vicissitudes of different administrations uh, that have different ideas of what places like how the CMR refuge are managed. And so we think that diversity of ownership with American Prairie providing more of a constancy in terms of policies that emphasize biodiversity restoration is important. Right now, the CMR refuge, I, I wanna mention it too, the Charles and Russell refuge needs a lot of support. I think generally funding is probably been flat or going down. Staffing is not what needs to be. Uh, we need to give more attention, not only to building new protected areas, but to helping existing ones, such, such as the refuge. But again, I think um, the best policy for American Prairie going forward is to retain ownership and provide that um, diversity of uh, a large protected area. Well, that message is loud and clear, uh, Kurt, um, and your book is in incredibly uh, welcomed here in our, our grasslands community, and I look forward to, to reading it it's in, in its entirety. And I'm honored to say I have worked with you in the field on building those prairie dog artificial burrows That's with right. mosquitoes That's right. and heat and everything else on American prairie. And um, you're a true conservationist and champion of all things grasslands. And we're just so honored that you could um, give this talk about your book and that you can continue uh, this important uh, plight that we're all involved with and, um, and, and needing for future generations. I mean, to me, that's, that's the so what, you know, question is, is we need to make sure our grasslands are protected, the species can, can recover for future generations and for our own well-being. Uh, but you've made that really clear and, and, and articulate and meaningful uh, with your work and, and with your books. And we, we very much look forward to this one. And um, I can't thank you enough for, for coming to present today and um, look forward to when I can work with you in the field again. <laughs> yeah, well, th again, thanks to you and Lindsay and, uh, and everybody else that's made this possible. And uh, I'm delighted to have a chance to, to talk about it. We do have, we have one more quick question if you have time here in the chat. Um, Adam is asking, do you have any thoughts on what, if anything, to do about the loss of the Rocky Mountain locust? Are the ideas for promoting other species or alternative forms of management that seem promising? Uh, I love that question. You know, I, 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 write, I write in the book that, you know, we could, obviously we could, we've got Rocky Mountain locust DNA. We could clone it at some point. If they don't, if they don't still exist in the wild, uh, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of people would think that'd be like letting the smallpox virus out of the lab. But you know, that was our attitude 100, you know, or 50, 60 years ago about wolves. No, no way, we killed them off in our parks. And uh, who knows, in 50 years or even less, we might say, "Wow, the Rocky Mountain locust. We can, uh, we can uh, restore a population and let it." play its historic ecological role in, in creating heterogeneity and feeding grassland birds across the Great Plains. So I don't uh, exclude the possibility. 
Amazing. Great. Well, thank you so much uh, to everybody who joined today. And uh, I will post this uh, on our website a little bit later. And thank you again so much to, to Curtis. This was yeah really lovely and informative. And I'm looking forward to reading your book. Thanks, everybody. Take thank care. you. Bye. Great.